I spoke with Heather McDonald, a best-selling author, an editor at City Journal, and a fellow at the Manhattan Institute. She offers no-nonsense approaches to homelessness and makes a strong case that today's rising crime is a direct result of politicians pandering to false accusations of racism. There's some really great parts of California. In fact, there's some even great parts of San Francisco. I mean, I live right across right across the, uh, the, the bridge from it. I go into a lot of neighborhoods. It's fine. There are no homeless people in Pacific Heights. Somehow Pacific Heights solved that problem. Somehow the Asian communities on, on the western part of the city completely solved homelessness. And, and you know, I've seen in the past few years the bad parts of, of Los Angeles get out of what have always been bad parts, at least in my lifetime, and move to the suburbs and move to places where they never were before. We were talking about the Fox Bureau uh, before. The, the L.A. Fox Bureau now has people living out on the tents within, you know, within 100 yards of it, a couple hundred yards of it, and that was miles away. Do you see the kind of bad parts shifting around more, more around like that? Or how do you how do you see that playing out? Well, the bad parts are expanding and it's all due to the lack of will to enforce bourgeois values. California has embraced what I call the great inversion, which is that it puts the uh, so-called needs or interests of the vagrants of people with antisocial behavior uh, deviancy ahead of those of law-abiding, property-respecting, authority-respecting, civil order-respecting Californians. And uh, this is a complete upside-down betrayal of the obligations of our public officials to look out first and foremost for the interests of those who are playing by the rules and are trying to get ahead through their own hard work and uh, self-discipline and deferred gratification. We have lost the will to enforce bourgeois norms. The, the solution to uh, widespread dystopian street colonization and vagrancy is very simple. You enforce laws that uh, are dedicated to maintaining public order. You are not allowed to colonize city streets. This is how police took care of the problem of the marginal for decades. Uh, and it focuses the mind. You know, if San Francisco or Los Angeles were to declare, as they did for decades, that you are not allowed to take over city sidewalks and force law abiding employees to gingerly pick through feces and hypodermic needles in the morning in order to get to their workplace. Uh, and, and so they were the, the vagrants and drug users and, and those in, in refuge and flight from the law were not allowed to take over the streets. It would focus the mind of policymakers away from these utopian schemes to give every street vagrant his own private apartment in San Francisco or Los Angeles at the cost of over $800,000 and make us come up with immediate financially viable solutions like congregate shelters outside of urban areas. I would advocate using abandoned industrial land or rural land outside of cities. I am a big fan of people that have the guts to embrace the nimbiest ethic, <laughs> not in my backyard. There is nothing shameful about saying you don't want a homeless shelter in your backyard. You don't want your kids to have to walk past a population that is extremely problematic. But the elites of California have simply lost the will to say that traditional bourgeois values are not racist, they're not classist, they are simply the bedrock of civilization. So, so here the phrase that you hear here being San Francisco, the phrase that you hear over and over again is we, we can't we can't criminalize poverty. And and that argument has, has kind of won out, I would say, among a majority of people who live in this city, or at least pretty darn close to it. How, how did that argument win, do you think? The same lack of will, the same lack of confidence of, of this country's elites in our traditional values, a, lo a lot of the abdication of responsibility on the part of our leaders to enforce basic common sense, wholly legitimate 
civilizational norms is race related. Uh, and, and that's a, a good part of this uh, ridiculous idea about criminalizing poverty. Uh, but it, it, there, there's broader issues going on as well, which is a failure of confidence in our civilization. Again, a lot of that is race related. But the idea that enforcing laws against street vagrancy, urination, public drug use, public crime is criminalizing poverty is completely specious. Uh, there are many, many low income people who are holding jobs who are not living on the streets. The reason people are living on the streets as I've been told many times in my on the ground reporting, whether it's at Skid Row in Los Angeles or the Tenderloin District in San Francisco, is because it's a, a lifestyle of complete uh, hedonism, self-indulgence, self-destruction, destruction of others. Somebody in uh, Skid Row said, oh yeah, people know that you can, you know, people in Iowa know that you can come to LA and do drugs on the streets without any kind of consequences. People are just gonna leave you alone. Mm -hmm. So contrary to what Chesa Boudin or the Coalition on the Homeless uh, in San Francisco or the ACLU in Southern California says, uh, this is not about criminalizing poverty. It's about criminalizing illegal behavior. So Chesa had a bad day. His, uh, um, I... I think you might have been a little bit surprised that he got uh, he got tossed out. Um, does that is that a small, minor, tiny step? Is it a is it a larger symbolism? How do you how do you kind of view that in the in the whole war that that's going on right now? Could be a huge step. We'll have to see what happens with the George Gascon recall. Gascon is the uh, elected district attorney in Los Angeles who already survived one recall effort mm -hmm. and is facing another. Uh, but did, did that did, excuse me? Did that come to the did that come to the ballot, or did they just not get enough signatures to get it up? I th I think they're still gathering signatures. I haven't. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure. Okay. Uh, whether it was the uh, targeted for voting now or voting in November. Mm -hmm. Um. But it could be that the Boudin recall could be a very very important moment in the overdue effort to reclaim civility in America's cities and to whether voters knew it or not, to reject the most destructive idea in our society today, which is disparate impact. I've got a book coming out on this topic next year. Uh, and the disparate impact conceit holds that any civilizational norm or meritocratic standard that has a disparate impact on blacks is per se racist and illegitimate. And so the reason, if you wanna understand what's going on in uh, across the country today in criminal law, you know, the puzzle of why are these prosecutors who are there to uphold the law, why are they seemingly on the side of criminals and are saying, we don't wanna put people in prison, we're not gonna prosecute, we're gonna ignore whole categories of crime uh, whether it's Chase Boudin or George Gascon or, or uh, uh, Alvin Bragg in, in, in Manhattan in New York City or Gonzalez in Brooklyn. There's a uh, Chris Kim Fox in, in Chicago, mm -hmm. Larry Krasner in Philadelphia, the DA in New Orleans. The reason that all of them have forsworn the traditional role of, of prosecutors and district attorneys is because if they do enforce the law in a colorblind, constitutional, neutral manner, it will disproportionately affect blacks. It will put blacks in prison at a higher rate. I'm, that is undeniably the case. But the explanation for that is not that the criminal laws are racist, it's that blacks have a much higher rate of criminal offending. But Boudin, you know, and, and when you hear these explanations for why we're not going to prosecute turnstile jumping, why we're not going to prosecute resisting arrest, why we're not prosecuting looting uh, or gun crimes. It, there will always be the mention of racial justice, and that's code for we've decided that we would rather not enforce the law than enforce the law and have it fall disproportionately on Blacks. So whether or not people understood what they were doing in recalling Chase Boudin, that is what they're doing. And it's it's a blow for the fact that 
the criminal justice system is not racist and that and when you stop enforcing the laws the people that you hurt most of course are law abiding minorities who are the first line of victims uh, in these insane drive by shootings uh, and and robberies and, and other types of crime. I mean, I remember when I was in early criminal justice classes, uh, like in, in college, uh, many, many years ago, there was often the blacks are being charged at higher rates because cops are racist, yet, et cetera, et cetera. The one that kind of blows that out of the water, though, is 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 murder rates. You you have a body. You know what color it is. You eventually find a certain percentage of, of those. It's 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 hard to overcharge murder. Right. And. I was blown away when I first discovered the disparity in in murder rates between blacks and whites in America. And I was looking at I was I was I was comparing a couple Texas cities trying to see some cities that had more permissive uh, uh, concealed carry permits versus and, and open carry permits versus or other places. And, you know, when you dig into those numbers, it's not 10 percent higher, 20 percent higher. Last year, or I guess it was 2021 or 2020. You know, it's 600 percent higher. It's 700. It's it's out of control craziness. And yet I wonder how even in those communities and I haven't really looked at any any polling in that, because I suspect that most blacks think that the criminal justice system is against them still and 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 that, that it is a racist system that, that targets them. On the other hand, they all know in in, in a lot of neighborhoods, everybody knows a number of people who's been murdered. I mean, how do, how do you think that that the black community kind of kind of deals with those two conflicting notions. It's a very complicated problem, and I've given a lot of my professional life to giving voice to those good law-abiding blacks in high crime areas who want the police to enforce the law, who see them as their friends, as their protectors, who completely oppose criminal behavior, uh, and are not playing the race card. But there's no question that there is support in the black community for the Black Lives Matter narrative, which is completely phony. You know, it's just amazing to me that these activists continue to get away with this idea. And the very phrase Black Lives Matter is so ridiculous, as if for the last 20 years, America has not been acting as if Black Lives Matter. Of course it has. Now we have an absolutely appalling history. We were gratuitously violent, nasty, hostile, condescending, cruel towards Blacks up until quite recently. The Civil War did not take care of that. The Civil mm -hmm. Rights Act did not take care of that. And that is a profound blemish on America's self-conception and you know, desire to see itself as the shining city on a hill. But we have done a 180 degree about face. And public policy has spent the last 50, 60 years trying to uplift Blacks. Every employer, mainstream employer in this country is twisting himself into knots to hire and promote as many Blacks as possible. Uh, and so the idea that we needed George Floyd race riots or you know, pro ri riots after Michael Brown shooting to say that Black Lives Matter is ridiculous, utterly ridiculous, a lie. Uh, but there are, I, it, is, it is true that many Blacks continue to believe that they are, that their biggest oppressor is whites, not other Blacks. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, whites are not the problem affecting blacks today they simply are not well, but we, might have, we might have started it but yeah no, i get it I, we you started know. it absolutely but you know it's very worrisome after this horrible stomach churning nauseating tragic heart-wrenching buffalo race massacre that was a white supremacist massacre but it is a drop in the bucket 10 blacks unjustly killed compared to 10,000 over 10,000 blacks who will be found to have been killed in 2021. There was 20, 2020, there was 10,000 blacks. There will be more in 2021. That race massacre is not the way blacks die. And yet, uh, you know, we keep hearing man on the street interviews from blacks saying, gee, you know, they're just terrified that they're gonna be shot down by a white supremacist when they go out their house. And they're being fed that lie by the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it's it's a preposterous, but I fear that that sense of accelerated paranoia and belief that whites are out to get them is going to lead to what is the an increased amount of what is the predominant uh, type of interracial violence in this country, which is black on white. Blacks commit 88% of all interracial violence between blacks and whites and whites and blacks. It is blacks who are routinely sadistically beating up on white people, dragging them in carjackings, running them over, you know, running over them with bikes in, ro in urban robberies. Uh, and whites turn their cheek away, they look away. And uh, the only time we hear about an interracial crime is when it's white on black, but those are extremely rare. Your, your garden variety black on white interracial crime is completely swept under the rug. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How much of it is is driven by, and I guess the, the, the phrase white guilt is probably a little a little overused, but when you go through a black neighborhood, you don't wanna be born there. I mean, I mean, there's there's a decent amount, you know, I just read Mike Mike Tyson's biography, who, who's done a lot of thuggish, awful things in his life. Right. But the first couple chapters were were horrific. It was it was almost unbelievable, the level of violence and of poverty and of just I mean, uh, and of growing up in a in a in a if it was in another country, I'd have a hard time believing it. And it was Brooklyn. And and so. As a white, you go through those neighborhoods. A lot of times you lock your doors and you get, you know, because you see a lot of bars on the on the windows. I think a lot of it seems to be driven by by that, by the thank God I wasn't born in that situation, because I think if I was born in in certain parts of Brooklyn, how different would you be than some of the people who are creating all the problems? And and at what point in life? You know, at what point in life does a victim become a perpetrator, right? I mean, you are a, you're a victim when you're an 11 year old growing up in that system. When you're 15 and you're robbing houses, at a certain point, you're, you're uh, you know, you're, you're 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 not that victim anymore. And and it, you know, we hear the term cycle of violence used uh, when people are trying to equate countries in the Middle East, but but it is a cycle of violence, and it is cycles that hasn't seemed to been breaking at, at, at any decent rate in our lifetimes. Yeah, I, I would add as a source of guilt, just the historical knowledge of of the travesty of, of this country's behavior when when lined up against its ideals. Let me, however, bracket and say that no other country is any better than America ever was. I mean, nations, tribes are are have been defined by violence. And the, if you want to see real violence and slavery and genocide go to Africa today uh, and go to Africa 400 years ago uh, when it was enslaving itself well, long before the Westerners showed up. And of course, we all know that the West African kings were utterly complicit in the transatlantic slave trade. But nevertheless, you know, America does pride itself on its ideals and we violated those ideals just appallingly for centuries. Right. Uh, so there's that guilt as well as as well as seeing the current vast opportunity gaps, uh, and that's an extraordinarily difficult issue. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that I would say the the ongoing civilizational backwardness and squalor of inner city neighborhoods today, it's, it's not helpful or accurate to attribute that primarily to alleged structural racism. It is behavior that is driving uh, these terribly dangerous, dilapidated, depressed areas. And how you change that behavior is very difficult, mm -hmm. but certainly uh, the child rearing practices are, are horrible. The breakdown of the family nationally, 71% of black children are born to single mothers. And that's a national average that takes into account, you know, more bourgeois blacks in inner city areas like Milwaukee or South side of Chicago, it's closer to 81, 85, probably 90%. And uh, 
boys take no responsibility for the children that they spawn. Mm -hmm. And there's very little attention to academic performance. We, we all know about the anti-acting white stigma, and yet we pretend that that doesn't affect school performance. And if Blacks lag behind academically, it must be because their teachers are racist, or if they're disciplined disproportionately as school students, it must be because their teachers are racist, which is a complete ludicrous proposition given that teaching is probably the most left-wing profession in the country. Um, so, you know, one can, we, we can trace these problems back to segregation and slavery, mm -hmm. but at this point, the change is gonna have to come from within. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a lie that we are stiffing inner city schools in, in per capita spending, just not the case. I mean, the, the highest funded schools are inner city schools, mm -hmm. but, and, and, you know, you can put an Asian kid in there and there was a, a, a woman, Ying Ma, that wrote a book several decades ago about her experiences growing up in the Oakland, California school district. And she had parents that insisted that she study. And her, her black peers, you know, were all dropping in, out of school, the same school she went to and, and joining gangs. And, and she got her way out of that environment. Uh, and, and it's the same elsewhere as well. Amy Wax, the beleaguered University of Pennsylvania law professor, wrote a book called Rights and Remedies that is a very astute analysis of how to think about ongoing Black inner city problems. She said, you know, you can, in, in the area of tort law and remedies, if somebody has been hit uh, negligently by a car, and there's no question that the driver was at fault. But at some point, the person who has been injured in that accident, the only person who can make sure that that person is rehabilitated, the victim is rehabilitated and able to get back on his feet, is himself by doing physical therapy, by taking care of his own, uh, his own betterment. And so even if we wanna say that all problems today in the black community originate from slavery, there's not a whole lot more, I believe, that whites can do in the area of reparations. The changes are gonna to have to come from within and they are cultural. They are junking the anti-white ethic, junking the philosophy that we have also turned our ears away from that we hear in rap music which tells us all we need to know about that culture, that it is grotesquely misogynistic, grotesquely anti-police, pro-violence, pro-drive-bys. That change has to come from within. Yeah, I mean, it's a very good point because actually they'd, they'd kind of have me on some of the discussions if instead of the term institutional racism, which every time I ask somebody to really explain it to me, it all comes about, well, redlining districts in the 50s and civil rights in the 60s. And I'm kind of like, get it up to speed because most of the institutional racism that I see is is in favor of, of blacks and other minorities at, at the expense of at the expense of Asians and whites. Yep. Uh, had had they used the phrase historical racism, then I'd say, you know what, you actually got a point there because, you know, the racism of America from the selection and pulling these people out of their own culture into this, you know, for hundreds of years has certainly been the driving force of creating, I think, a lot of the problems, maybe most of the problems in that in that culture. Now you have a good point at what, you know, are there still things that 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 white America or America can do on that? And I don't know the answers to that. I mean, I actually think affirmative action, which is, of course, just as another word for, for racial preferences, made sense at certain points in life. When, when there's no doctors in a community and, and, and a young kid can't see a doctor of, of, of that looks like him or her, it kind of makes sense to put your thumb on the scale and say, let's jumpstart that. I don't know what the answers are. I mean, I know that if I had the answers and you had the answers, probably the last people the black community want to listen to is two middle-aged white people who are doing pretty well off, living in the suburbs, bitching about black crime. 
But I don't see it coming from any. I mean, you know, it was one of the terrible things about uh, about Bill Cosby getting getting torn down. There was, you know, he was one of the guys that was like, okay, he is a he is a cultural icon. There, he is saying some some things that I think that community needs to hear, and they ain't going to listen to me. And then, of course, it turns out he's a serial rapist, and and that kind of blew up 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 on it. I mean, what's what's the path out of that? I, I would bracket the rapist aspect. Maybe he is. I don't know. I, I think Me Too is, has so discredited itself that I am skeptical towards all of its claims, but that's a side issue. Right, right. Um, you know, I agree. There are, there are Black po political leaders that don't get much attention that are very much embracing an ethic of personal responsibility, respect for bourgeois values. There's a guy out in the suburbs of Milwaukee, Kendall Quarles, who that's Q-U-A-R-L-E-S, mm -hmm. that is very forthright about uh, the need to embrace self-discipline. And, and there's others as well. You know, I would say Tim Scott is a bit compromised. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't buy his line about having been racist, pulled over disproportionately by racist police officers. I would want to know what his rate of speeding is. And maybe he was, I don't know. But, you know, there's the driving while black conceit also rests on a complete ignorance of, of disparate rates of, of speeding and other types of, of traffic violations. Uh, it Where? was possible to study those and found that blacks speed at much higher rates than whites. So if they're pulled over more, that's probably the reason. Well, you had some, uh, you had some uh, cameras, you had some red light cameras that that they had a certain problem with in certain neighborhoods because the cameras were disproportionately catching black people running red lights. And it was like, now what do you do? Right. I mean, yeah. this is the search for racism is so desperate because it's so, there's so little racism, in fact, among well meaning whites now. You're absolutely right. There are realities black privilege, not white privilege that we now are claiming that machines are racist, whether you know the algorithms of facial recognition or, or, or red light cameras, license plate readers, the town of Oak Park, Illinois, recently in the news for its uh, decision to use different standards for grading students. And it managed to persuade the left-wing fact-checking press that this was a fake story, whereas it was in fact quite legitimate, but it also, declined its police chief's request for license plate readers as a way to counter the rising tide of carjackings because those readers were gonna be racist. Right. Um, so it's, it's simply amazing. I mean, whites are involved in this Lady Macbeth-like hand-washing. It's, it's, it's bordering on neuroses at this point of blaming themselves for phantom racism rather than being willing to hold all groups responsible for the same standards. It, it doesn't help uh, the underclass to be held to a lower standard of expectation. That is not the way to solve those cultural problems. I do think that there is, is a, a racial and sometimes age-ism, whatever, whatever the word is on that, by a lot of police in, in the sense that, look, when I was a kid, a lot, and I was a pretty good kid. I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't. I'd never talk back. I, I served. I did the whole thing. Cops were bigger assholes to me when I was young, because they could be. And I experienced that a handful of times. Their, the the black glasses went on. Their chest puffed out. And and a good chunk of cops. I don't know what that percentage is, but my gut tells me it's in the twenties. You know, they've they like being bullies and they love having a badge. And and I think that blacks experience that a lot they they get they get mistreated a lot not not necessarily arrested for crimes they didn't they didn't commit but but treated like lesser people and once i started driving and you know you drive a, a lesser you drive a junkier car you're also treated less by cops once i started getting of the right age and having cars that, that were shiny all of a sudden they started using the word sir on me uh, back and back and forth. I mean, I talked to one. I remember when I was talking to uh, an executive at the Fox News Channel, and you know, he he talked about going through stores and and I don't think he was making this up. You know, going with his son who happened to be a Marine, and this guy was you know probably a millionaire because he was one of the top executives there, talking about how 
he definitely could tell that they were being watched by by the the, the owners and and by the by the the people there because he was black he feels that a lot now you can see the other side because they say what percentage of people are black what percentage of those people are 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 you know robbing the place or 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 doing things but it seemed like a lot of of the resentment towards maybe cops and 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 other things were kind of that low level insult more than you know driving while black i pulled you over well it I seems like just, a dysfunctional relation it seems like a bad marriage sometimes i think you've described two different phenomena one illegitimate and one uh arguably legitimate you're right. if you're right that cops are gratuitously treating black drivers with contempt with lack of courtesy and respect and professionalism that is completely abhorrent and unjustified i don't know you know where you get that information and if it is truly worse for blacks than it is for whites my experience with police officers is that like <laughs> new york police officers are universally obnoxious you know you try and ask them please how do i get through this parade you know where do how many blocks dozens of blocks north do i have to walk before i'm allowed to cross fifth avenue hey lady i'm not a tourist guide <laughs> yeah, i know they'll be you know they'll be completely unhelpful no matter what your skin color is mm. uh but but generally i i think that cops they they believe in what i hear from them all the time is they they want to believe that the good people of the community support us mm -hmm. and they they know who the gangbangers are and yeah they're probably sort of cynical with them but i think towards law-abiding blacks that is not my experience but you know maybe you've got better sources than i certainly I, there's no numeric way to do that but but again i can tell in my own life when i when i aged a little bit that all of a sudden the the dickish behavior reduced itself well yeah, maybe would, maybe that was me but but Maybe not. I mean, technically, age is probably a protected category in the civil rights laws. I would say if cops are dickish towards young boys, I really don't care. If they're dickish towards blacks, that is a problem. Well, and I think I think what it is is they 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 will often throw their weight around the people that they think that they can throw their weight around, right? I mean, that's what bullies do. Bullies don't bullies don't push around people who they think might push back and and that pushing back might be when I get home and call my you know call my attorney or, or something like that well, so that that's where have, I think that that's similar a cop would have to be absolutely ignorant today to think you can push around a black person I mean the, the as soon as a cop gets out of his car if he's investigating a shooting he finds himself surrounded by people with their cell phones out cursing at him uh you know in oh and and having a cell phone out I've seen I've seen videos of 180 degree differences in behavior when somebody realizes they're being recorded um, and that's that's probably in my opinion the best thing to come out of the black lives matter this whole you know this this whole ferguson 2.0 and i want to talk about ferguson in a little bit is is police body cams uh um it, it is a i think it's good for them i think uh it's something that a lot of cops resisted just like they resisted uh, 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 you know, the cameras in, in patrol cars. And all of a sudden that turned out to be their, their, their best friends. There is a, I don't know. I don't know if you like watching people shooting each other, but I guess I do sometimes. There's a, a YouTube site called police activities, police activity, uh, millions of followers shocked. It's still up on YouTube. And it is basically, they're the best at, at grabbing, you know, cause now all cities after a shooting, especially after a fatal shooting, for the most part, very quickly release that uh, when they're smart, quickly release that that body cam because 95 times out of 100, it shows exactly what happened. And, you know, that unarmed person, you know, suddenly had a knife or, or, or whatever it is. And I would say, you know, and I've watched I've probably watched police kill over 50 people on on these things. But you get tremendous lessons from it. I mean, one of the lessons you get is a large percentage of the people they shoot, the guys they shoot want to die. Uh, that you know a good chunk of those are are suicide by cops and then a good chunk of those are 
I think a rage switched hit, you know, they're smacking their wife, they're, 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 their brain short circuited, they get into a rage, the door opens up, they got a knife and they, and they jump at the next person who they see, who, you know, happens to have a Glock pointed at them and, and they end up, and they end up dead. I, I would say between those two things, you know, clearly mentally ill people slash suicidal people and and just the rage machine that's 80 percent of 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 shootings in a, police shootings in america and and i really think that they should almost make that a mandatory class for kids to watch those videos because you learn a lot you learn a lot about human behavior well and and you know this is another truism of our age that conservatives like to say you could also decrease i would say the vast majority of, of fatal police shootings by not ever resisting arrest you know that that's behind practically all of these is people that are running for the cops, beating them up, you yeah. know, just comply, comply, take it up with your lawyer afterwards if you think the cop is acting illegally, but that, you know, you, you're not gonna get killed, I think, in, in vast, vast majority of cases if you comply with author's authority. Yeah, Officers like like 98%. I mean, there's a couple instances of the guy running down the street and, and the cop deciding to shoot him in the back and, and those guys right. usually go to prison for murder. As, as right. should. But I, I want to return, though, to your your two instances of oh, sure. alleged racism, which is the cops treating blacks with contempt. And again, I just want to bracket that if that's the case, then it's really bad. And we have a hell of a lot more police training to do. I, I'm 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 skeptical that that's widespread. But your second example is the being fo followed around or watched more closely in stores. And that's a difficult issue because that is mm -hmm. perfectly rational behavior. Right. Uh, you know, there are stereotypes and there are stereotypes that are correct. And the fact of the matter is, is that blacks do commit the vast majority of shoplifting. We've seen this, the videos since the George Floyd riots of these remarkable, increasingly sort of uh, casual mass looting events. Most recently, the, the Sephora in uh somewhere in la cerritos right. i think right. uh of these young kids or you know adolescents with big black trash bags just casually walking through the store and 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 dumping the shelf contents into their bags and walking off but we saw one of those again a, a year or so ago and the videos of these mass looting events are virtually all black and yet we're pretending that uh that's not the case and the reason why stores in your neighborhood up in San Francisco, like Walgreens, have closed down uh, and, and are denying the elderly senior citizens easy access to their prescriptions is they would rather just shut down entirely than accost somebody for shoplifting and call the cops and be accused of racial profiling. So we, again, as, as a society, we are backing away from enforcing neutral norms in order not to have a disparate impact on blacks and it's a it's an incredibly frustrating thing i am sure if you're a law-abiding black to be followed around in a store and felt like you're being watched that's but, rational to get upset at that it's you know you can understand the rationality on both sides right really and the solution you know the solution to that is not to stop enforcing the law right. and it is human nature to say we are going to make judgments based on averages, the solution is to get the crime under control. I've read your your columns or articles for years, and and you've been consistent on this. And and and, and I very rarely disagree with with the things you write. D does it? Is it tough in, in the sense that in the last two years, everything that you've been writing about for the last fifteen years? has has taken such an overwhelming loss i mean in, in the sense that that it's like you know i'm saying this this makes sense we you know look we're old enough that we've seen these cycles go before we lived in the 70s the 80s we, i saw new york go from a shithole to a place where you could let your kids go out into Times square at four o'clock in the morning and now it's turning back into a shithole again and and you know you had a lot of things that made common sense and a shooting and a summer of riots and and a few things and the essential truths that you write about have gotten jammed down into a corner like I've never seen in a in a period of six months, month. Does that get 
Does that get depressed? How, how do you, I don't know, how do you, how do you, how do you deal with that personally when it's like, holy shit, I've been helping move this debate in the right direction. One shooting, a bunch of, a bunch of politicians abdicating their, their, their role in life. And it took such a, a, a backwards hit. I greatly appreciate your, your, uh, kind words and, and, and following me in the sense that I m may have had any contribution to this discourse. I, I would say that what I find depressing is more just the substance of it as opposed to uh, the sense of not getting heard. What is difficult is feeling like I'm repeating myself all the time. I mean, there's only so many times you can say, right. but what about the black victims? Like what right. about the 50 black children who were gunned down in drive-by shootings in 2020 right. in their beds and front yards and porches and barbecues and barbecues jumping on trampolines what about those black kids i thought black lives matter why aren't you protesting that there's only so many times you can say that and i search for new ways of making the same arguments but what depresses me is rather seeing the things that i love and revere being torn down now in this mass psychosis of white people deciding that they are uh the source of all evil and the effects on say classical music, on art museums that have now all declared themselves anti-racist institutions and are declaring classical music a racist tradition or uh, you know, Dutch Baroque 17th century portraiture or still lifes, a, a vehicle of, anti, of colonialism and slavery. These are ludicrous arguments and yet they are being embraced now by the the guardians of our traditions, those who are the uh, have the great privilege to be leading classical music organizations or opera companies or leading the great uh, encyclopedic museums, whether it's the Chicago mm -hmm. Art Institute or the Met Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, that have now declared that their collections are racist and need to be decolonized. This is sickening to me because I feel like I the greatest privilege we have is to be the recipients of the works of sublimity of Western civilization. My life has been so much enriched by the study of literature, by immersing myself headlong into the tradition of classical music. And now that is all at risk. And, and you know, the, the assault on literature has been going on for since the 1980s with the rise of know nothing multiculturalism and feminism, the classical music attack is, is post George Floyd. Mm -hmm. uh, art, art was regarded as, as a, a means of, of silencing voices in the academy starting in the 1980s. But now, as I say, you have the leaders of some of the greatest art museums in the world turning on their own collections. It's absolutely appalling. Mm -hmm. So that to me, uh, is a, a source of utter spirit crushing uh, fatigue and a sense of, I don't know how we're gonna get out of this. Uh, but the only thing you can do, I, I just get so angry every time I see another uh, unjustified assault on this extraordinary tradition of Western civilization and science that you just have to fight back even though I do feel, I mean, I'm a pessimist by nature, but at this point, it sure does feel like a losing battle. Notwithstanding, you know, if you want to be optimist, you look at the Virginia, Glenn Youngkin and, and mm. Chesa Boudin getting voted out and whatnot. But those, there's still a heck of a lot of elite institutions that have gone 100% insane since George Floyd. And I don't see that turning around. What it'll take is, white people saying, I refuse to be called the problem any longer. I refuse to say that George Bi Joe Biden is unifying when he says white people in this country today uh, are still meeting out racial injustice and are filled with hate. It's just not true. And whites have to stop turning the other cheek and accepting this calumny. Where, where I have seen a line that, that clearly exists is when it comes to kids and that's and that's why i think you know look a bunch of assholes on college campuses whatever the, you know there've been there've been crazy assholes ever since i was ever since i was 15 years old i think the average person kind of rolls their eyes at it 
Um, uh, you know, you look at a number of institutions and you talk about art things and things that I'm 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 not high class enough to be be involved with. Although watching you know watching the the pull down of statues of 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 brilliant thought leaders who advanced human civilization has been has been kind of kind of depressing. But it does seem that one line is. When you get that stuff into schools, that certainly helped push Yunkin. I think that that's I'm, I'm seeing that in, and and kids, the Florida kind of kind of flip around on it. I, you know, the one place that I'm not convinced that is going to have that same kind of uh, same kind of backlash to is California, considering you know considering some of the new the new algebra standards where you know one plus one equals you're a white supremacist. Um, did this stuff start at the colleges and and burble out and successfully get off of that? In other words, where, where I I kind of think that I, I saw the 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 anti free speech movement really start on college campuses. You were a victim of that. You know, I can I can point to person after person, and and you know you were you were mistreated at the college I went to, which was one of the few conservative uh, you know conservative liberal arts schools in the world. And 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 you know they did their best to drive you off 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 of there. Did it start in the colleges and burble out? And if so, how how was it finally effective? Considering that kind of school of, you know, America sucks and everybody was racist thought has been out there for a long time. Well, first of all, um, thank you for the Claremont McKenna reference, and I will just say that I wasn't mistreated, speech was mistreated. You know, I don't really sure. care, although it was certainly sobering to hear this mob baying for my head and you, you uh, to, to realize you're facing sheer irrationality uh, and ignorance on the part of these students is, is, is really an extraordinary experience as a, on a visceral level. Mm -hmm. You can hear about it, but when you're actually in the presence of hysteria, it's, it's very disturbing. Uh, with all due respect, your reaction when you say, oh, you hear about college, you know, idiocies, whatever. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Ken, you're part of the problem. <laughs> uh, you are those people that for decades did turn their eyes away from universities and say, mm -hmm. oh, it's a couple of assholes acting stupidly. They've acted stupidly on college campuses for decades. Right. No. Every bad idea in college has gotten out. It was a mistake for America to turn its eyes away. You know, uh, there's a, a Washington columnist, his name eludes me now, Michael, fab, fabulous long, long-standing columnist that wrote a book uh, on hard America and soft America and saying, oh, well, you know, soft America is the college campus with all these ha 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 cute little snowflakes who say that they're they need safe spaces in order to read Ovid's Metamorphoses. <clears throat> but as soon as they get into um, Michael Barone, as soon as they get into hard America, the free market economy, they're just going to have to pull up their bootstraps. Barone was so naive. We have seen the the annual belching of these of these self-indulgent narcissists out of colleges each year infecting corporations and turning them left. Uh, the idea that speech is somehow a form of violence uh, and is rightfully censored, that is now taking over our society. It's not just big tech. You're going to see government uh, doing that. What's going on in law schools is terrifying. You have the most elite law students in the country at Yale and Harvard uh, embracing the idea of belief survivors, which is a violation of due process of the presumption of innocence. Uh, and they're going to accede to the bench because Harvard and Yale graduates from its law schools, a, a vast disproportionate share of federal judges. Uh, so none of this stuff should have been ignored. And I've, I have been writing on it since the early 1990s. And uh, I, it is, I will say, it is discouraging that apparently people just laughed it off. I guess, I mean, for me, I, I do have an independent attachment to the university. I, I aspire to be a comparative literature professor. Let me go back to the Barone, the Barone, the Barone thesis because that was kind of my own and which certainly 
is now proven wrong, but for 30 years seemed to be the seemed to be look there were there were there were crazy lefties that were running colleges when before you and I went to college. And it did seem that you know, youth who likes to well, youth transitioning to adults, there's a lot of changes that that goes on on that. And the concept that when they came out into the real world, they'd have to stop it, pull up their pants, wipe their nose and and do it and and start to to be affected by the world that worked for for decades and and then it stopped in other words you know the corporations in the 70s weren't weren't doing this stuff or in the 80s even even throughout the 90s whereas the colleges still kind of had that why did that side win do you think why how did it escape from there and and whether the barone and to, to accept my thesis was was always wrong and and it just took that that kind of time to overcome itself how did it how did how did the craziness that was always there to some extent on colleges in the last probably 50 years how did it escape and 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 win well first of all in the 90s in the early 1990s you had the corporate diversity consulting movement our roosevelt thomas and others that were going around there with the, sort of the precursors of abraham kendi and robin d'angelo today telling corporations that they were racist for having no, so-called white norms about promptness and accuracy that it were impeding black progress in the corporate world. And uh, this, this consulting scam took over corporations and you had employees in the early nineties being sent to diversity training. So we have a very short memory. This has been going on for a long time. The eighties, you may be right, I would just say it's a question of critical mass. Mm -hmm. uh, you have enough employees coming out of these universities, moving up the ranks in the corporate world that have been told that America is profoundly racist and that meritocratic standards are racist and that uh, uh, you know the whole revolution in, in sexual harassment law, the turning of men into per se villains and 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 bearers of toxic masculinity that was all happening in the 80s and 90s so uh i don't think it was so sudden i think it it was a, a gradual accumulating idea and um the more i would also say a, another problem is and i don't know if this is cause or effect what drives this but the feminization of our culture with the more that institutions go female, the more left wing they are. And that's certainly true in universities, but it's true in businesses as well. And I would say the whole COVID hysteria phenomenon uh, in the West at least was certainly a product of the feminization of our culture and the failure to act rationally, to apply cost benefit analysis, to understand that risk is inherent in all human activities and in civilization itself. So, uh, but what, why females started taking over and males seated, you know, we're, we're sort of in a, a Zeno's paradox here of, of, of a endlessly receding uh, root cause. It's, it's a very hard thing to come up with one single, single cause here. You know, I use that dichotomy, the, the feminization, when I look at, at cities and homelessness and, and the cities that, that, that have that those more feminine characteristics than masculine characteristics are the ones with all the homeless people. Um, um, and and you know, and 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 I use the word nice. It's probably not the right word, but a superficial, you know, people in 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 the the the, the cities that end up allowing people to be abused and having their life ruined out in public and 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 to create those problems are often filled with people who are very compassionate. And and that that's a better word, I guess, than, than niceness. And and that compassion just seems to create horrific problems. Um, um, you know, I saw that when I, you know, when it, it was it was kind of mind blowing when I when I first moved to San Francisco, maybe maybe five years ago. Uh, and again, I don't live in the city. I live I live out, outside of it into it into into just seeing the. I mean, it's not a homeless problem. It's 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 a mental health problem. It's a drug problem. You know, you could, uh, the average 
person here still doesn't understand that if you gave homes away for ten thousand dollars a piece, you'd have the exact same number of homeless people on 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 the uh, on the sidewalk. But and and you get you know you get used to kind of anything. I was in journalism for years, and and you 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 build up walls to that. Doctors in emergency wards build up up walls to to having people die and come in with blood on their face. And when I first came into the city and, you know, and you'd, you'd see a guy sitting, you know, with drool coming out of his mouth in his wheelchair, obviously screwed up and the whole world going by as there were there were as though nothing was happening. It was um, it was it was a difficult transition. It was uh, it was it was shocking. Um, you know, it gets less so the 15th guy you see or the 50th guy. And and but I you know I wonder if 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 this frog has boiled so slowly that people people have have become numb to that here. Yes, uh, Dennis Prager I heard recently a couple of days ago was addressing just this issue of niceness and you know places like Minneapolis. You know these are really nice Midwesterners and yet right. many people there are willing to tolerate uh, behavior that is clearly it's it's not compassionate. You know the one. The, the conservatives tried so many types of jujitsu to see if like, how do we get through to the left? Like, let's let's use their tools against them and right. show that, you know, they what they say they're for Black Lives Matter. But what about the black victims, for God's sakes? And you can say the same thing. It's not compassionate to leave people on the street. Mm -hmm. I'm for compassion, too. Uh, and that doesn't work. I would say, like, with regards to the street vagrancy problem, there's two camps. There's the, the dumb, idiotic, just nice people that don't get it. But there's also driving this are people that are uh, on a very vicious ideological crusade. And that is the activists, that is the advocates. And they want the homeless on the streets because they serve as, as uh, their exhibit A in the callousness of capitalism and they will fight tooth and nail any kind of policy that will get them off and so i don't think they're driven by niceness i think they're driven by hatred of of western norms uh and and those people have to be fought tooth and nail but yes we do have i i think as a society generally we have lost the will to enforce stigma and that is a niceness issue you know, that we we don't want to stigmatize single parents. And a lot of us are compromised by divorce. You know, a lot of the white upper class, middle class, mm -hmm. they do marry initially, which is certainly better than starting out as a single mother, but divorce rates are very high. And we used to stigmatize divorce. Uh, people would be drummed out of their country club. We certainly stigmatize single mothers. Uh, 19th century literature is filled with heart-wrenching stories from the perspective of a single mother who is, mm -hmm. who is exiled from her community for breaking the, the very powerful norm of, of chastity until marriage. And, but society understood at the time that in order to have norms that are good for the largest number of people, you are going to have to apply stigma on those who break them. And now we've reversed things. We're so unwilling to stigmatize individuals. And as a result, we have no more norms. We have no norm enforcement. And the result is a hell of a lot more suffering because uh, those norms arose over centuries as something that are, is necessary for the best functioning of the largest number of people. And now we're too nice and you know we're certainly not going to stigmatize divorced parents and we so can't stigmatize it, anything you can't stigmatize anything you know i i, I Except saw racism I, when, of course <laughs> I, I also disagree you know the the conservatives line on the left is always oh they're relativistic and nihilistic and godless mm -hmm. and whatnot this is what happens when you don't believe in god or values or whatever no the left is ruthlessly moralistic ruthlessly they believe they have the truth they are not they are not epistemological or ethical relativists. It's just a whole different set of truths they have. And they will, God knows, you know, we've seen with cancel culture and hate speech, they will stigmatize the so-called racist or right. sexist. Uh, but that, I'll that, tolerate anything except intolerance. 
Exact. Well, and yeah, but they they are intolerant themselves. So you, they don't. You know, when I grew up, so I'm 57. When I grew up in 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 the high school years, the the social message that the schools w pushed on on you know every every time that they could get it was don't do drugs. It was Nancy Reagan years. It was it was drug drug drug. Every time you go to a to a uh, you know to the to the rally or the or or you know you'd have that special speaker in. He was always telling you not to do drugs. In my kids' generations, who are now in their in their in their twenties it was all about bullying and and I, and they would have an anti-bullying conference or confab at my kids junior high and high school all the time and 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 i do see how and you know and of course the opposite of a bully is is a victim and the worst person in the world is a bully and therefore is often the the person we should we should appreciate and, and love and, and support the most is is a victim and and i've definitely seen kind of that group grow up into you know when you say you can't you can't stigmatize anything well you can't bully somebody because they're mentally ill or poor or taking a crap in the middle of the street because he can't get into the starbucks well now he can get into the starbucks but um i don't know i i think that those things are somehow somehow linked with with our our progression over the last few decades interesting yeah i i would say so and and so we have harm reduction and people you know being celebrated in a sense using drugs in public uh and the bullying thing of course began really with the gay issue mm -hmm. uh and nobody wants to acknowledge you know the the real cruelty there again i'm sound race obsessed but the the violence in black schools of student on student violence is really something uh and there's a hell of a lot of bullying there, but that's not really the focus. It's on these white kids, but white girls can be absolutely cruel. So you're right, you know, this can get out of hand. But um, I, I would say, I mean, one problem perhaps is just the introduction of the whole social service bureaucracy into the schools. Mm -hmm. And so little time is spent on true academic preparation which is really their value added. It's not socializing. Um, so, but again, if we focus exclusively on academic accomplishment, then we come up against the disparate impact problem again. And so we're devaluing that and we're getting rid of gifted and talented programs and algebra in, in middle school and high school in order to try and pretend the academic skills gap doesn't exist. Again, no, no black community wants to listen to me, but it's, it's, I find it so sad when when you you know when you see some serious problems and and you can blame a community but you certainly can't blame you know the young people born into that community that you know they I, I can't imagine if I was born on a different side of the tracks and then you see something like was it the Washington or Oregon uh, governor who signed the bill saying we're going to we're getting rid of of uh, of of testing to get out of high school because it disproportionately help, hurts minority people and and you're like, OK, so now we've just once again lowered the standards. We've set people back in the name of progress, just, you know, whether it's whether it's taking away, taking away funding for police in neighborhoods, whether it's holding holding, you know, trying to ha push everyone to a high standard of of of, of academic progress. And when you see when you see that that the solutions that are coming out of this are doing the absolutely 180 degree wrong thing, it's uh it's a little depressing. Well, whites are terrified that the academic skills gap and the behavior gap is not going to close uh, for whatever reason. And so they've decided to just give up on expecting it to close and are instead right. just tearing down standards. So that's um, there, as I say, the elites right. are absolutely terrified that this is a problem that is going to be with us. And they've adopted solutions that are are absolutely dysfunctional and are guaranteeing that it will continue all said the 80s seem to be even worse i mean i mean we're getting we're getting there when it comes to crime stats when it comes to murder rates you know when you look at you know i did some back of the envelope envelope calculations the other day when you looked at i think it was murder rate was about in america was about 10 uh per hundred thousand per year then it in 1980 
dropped down a little bit in the 90s, but it was still pretty darn high. And then it's settled into about six uh, uh, of that. And um, and then it's, of course, in the last in the last couple of years has been spiking up 20, 30 percent, you know, between probably 19, 20 and 21. And, you know, when you calculate the number of people who would be dead if we still had that 80s crime rate between then and now, it's a half a million people. I mean, it's a city the size of Atlanta that would that would be wiped out. I'm a little encouraged that because this came about so quickly in the in the in the post, uh, you know, we'll call it Ferguson 2.0, but the uh, that 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 we're reacting to it more quickly than we did in the you know in in the late 70s or early, early 80s. But I mean, crime and punishment was was much softer then. It was it was crazily soft in in the in 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 that period of time and and we're you know we're not we're not there yet do you see are you are you encouraged by the fact i guess that it's that it's come back quick enough that people are saying wait a second this is crazy we need to tamp it down again or do you think we go through a three decade or two and a half decade time of 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 you know insanity out there like we did like we did when we were young yeah, and, and I would say you say the 80s were much worse. The 70s were worse than the 80s, and uh, the 60s were really bad, too. I mean, the 70s was probably the absolute nadir uh, as far as urban crime uh, and police killings. You know, I mean, killings of police officers were just mm -hmm. off the charts. Uh, and, and so there was a reaction starting in the late 70s, early 80s against alternatives to incarceration, uh, and and movements to have determinate sentences so that it was reducing judges discretion. You had the rise of the three strikes and you're out laws in California, which spread, which were very good ideas. Repeat offenders are that's a serious problem. And the fact that somebody has so called, you know, well, he's only stolen a pizza on his third strike and he's out. Yeah, but believe me, between his second and third strike and his first and his second strike, he has been doing a hell of a lot of crime. And he knows he's on notice that he's, you know, facing a three, three strikes. And outs. That is somebody to get off the streets for sure. We without apology. You know, you know, uh, a lot of people won't remember that you're talking about a very specific case. And, and it was in Southern California. And I remember how it was misrepresented even back in the day, mm -hmm. because, it, you know, so in his life, he had a, he had a rap sheet. You know, you were like, this is the type of person we should just, you know, let die and, and bury and, 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 and do a do over. And his last strike was when he, and this was a big, big, angry, often violent guy, walked up to some kids and, and it, you know, it wasn't like he was grabbed a piece of pizza and ran away. He demanded it from them. It was, it was a robbery, not a, not, not a theft. And he then became, and then they put him away for, for, you know, and, and he was exact, you know, you looked at it, it's like, this is the exact kind of person that, that, that that cells without doors are created for right yeah. and he became the poster child for it but the la times never never really uh, never really yep. did that i was yep. i was very involved in the criminal justice case yep. back yep. back in the day so is it are we are we learning the lesson faster now and you know i i don't know i i think that those all in the 70s all of the uh parole and probation experiments probably also had a racial justice element to them. Uh, but now that racial justice element is so predominant and we have every institution unlike uh, then, and, and you're right, I, I would agree with you that in the 60s and 70s, for God's sakes, I mean, the AMA and the ABA were still sort of rock, you know, solid Republican organizations. Right. You know, right. Who can imagine now? now you know, every pronouncement out of the AMA, the American Medical Association is, is oh, woe is me, doctors are racist and they all need to be sent to anti-racism training and we need to get rid of medical standards in, in medical schools uh, because we're not graduating enough blacks or admitting enough blacks. I mean, the AMA and the ABA are almost indistinguishable from uh, a black studies department on at, at Yale University or UC Berkeley. Um, but the fact that the anti-racism and the racial guilt has spread so widely uh, among uh, our mainstream institutions, I think will make it more difficult to 
uh, return to necessary consequences for criminal behavior. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a mayor in New York now, Eric Adams, who, when he was within the New York Police Department, was one of the worst racial rabble rousers, constantly accusing the NYPD of racial profiling because it stopped and questioned more blacks than whites. Well, that's who's committing the shootings, guys. Sorry. You know, that's just the way it is. Um, but he seems to have done an about face and, and was elected as a law and order candidate. But to the extent that he can follow through and start using proactive policing again and, and getting the cops and the prosecutors to work together and enforce the law, he's going to run up against the disparate impact charge because he mm -hmm. will be arresting blacks more. Uh, and that's already being used against him by Alvin Bragg. Uh, you know, that was Chase, Chase and Boudin. Every, that's the argument everywhere. So I'm not sure how easily it's going to be to return to that, uh, the necessary crime policies, given the ubiquity and strength of the disparate impact concept today. Until you get enough victims who keep having their, I mean, Right. You know, I remember living in New York during the Dinkins years, you know, and and it was and it was. And so people always ask me, when do you think San Francisco will turn around? And I'm like, I think it's got another lower to go. I mean, uh, you know, yes, yesterday's Chase of Boudin thing was was uh, was a, a good sign. It's a good sign that at least London Breed, whether I believe her or not, is now actually talking like she doesn't like criminals. Uh -huh. Now, she was one of the first ones to take i forget it was it was over 10 million dollars from from the police from the police budget and literally be like we're giving it to black groups it was there was no there was no you know there was no uh, uh ifs ands or buts there wasn't even any kind of like underprivileged groups it was no we're, we're taking this money and we're giving it to this this ethnic group here and now she's pounding her fist and uh and uh, and, and and you know sounding it, obviously, the polls are, are 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 turning, and enough people are saying, you know, I don't want to go into the city anymore. You know, we're also seeing cities; people are voting with their feet. You know, one of the reasons why I asked you that early question about are people moving and shifting out? I mean, I made a decent amount of money from that whole nonsense because I owned a home that was kind of inland from Malibu a little bit, a little bit of the country. It was forty five minutes to get to L.A. Between COVID, people could work at home, and between now and Sherman Oaks, you have you have tents in the Ralph's parking lot. And 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 the the crap from the central cities burbled out. Everybody moved and uh, you know prices jumped up twenty twenty five percent in in those in those places. And I and I sold a home and it was like you know I I kind of hate to profit. From, I didn't hate to profit from it. I I felt bad that the situation existed, but um, but I but you know and and today we can we you know we see the migration of 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 where people are still moving to, and so so there's certainly a number of people. Uh, you know, a number of people voting, voting with their feet. But yeah, I'm not sure if we've hit that that zenith and those those bad points and if they'll be overwhelmed by the concept of of, you know, disparate numbers, you know, a disequity when it comes to when it comes to to that. But well, if white kids start getting shot and drive by shootings, things will turn around pretty fast, I think. Uh, right now, you know, it's all black kids. And so the nation doesn't care. The media doesn't care. The media doesn't give a damn about black children dying in drive-bys. Right. It's appalling. And, 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 in, and in fairness, it's, it's, it's a very good point. I mean, I, I just don't see cops in my neighborhood that much, and I don't see too many criminals. It's, it's just I live in a radically different world than just over the bridge in, in, in certain neighborhoods there that are just Lord of the Flies type. type well, things. nobody should apologize for that. You know, I think we've gotten to the point where you feel guilty about Oh yeah, things are nice and stable and clean here. No, everybody has a right to that. That is not a, right. you don't achieve that at somebody else's expense. It's right. not zero sum. Right. Public order is is win-win and everybody has a right to it, but nobody should feel guilty about the fact that he can send his children outdoors without worrying about them getting shot. That is, that is the case in black neighborhoods and it's not white people are shooting him, it's blacks. But those good law-abiding Blacks have an, an entitlement, a right to have the same freedom from fear as white people do or as, as bourgeois Blacks do in, in their uh, neighborhoods. So that, you know, but we've gotten so guilty and, and so preposterously self-incriminating that people feel a little bit 
uh, hangdog about about that. If reality. you're privileged. Well, it's the privilege. You know, here's the if you want to talk about privilege. It's the two parent family privilege. That's yeah. the privilege. If you want, you know, if you're a child and you're you haven't been born yet and you're in kind of a um, uh, a, a Rawlsian experiment. Mm-hmm. And you can choose to be born to a single mother with forty thousand dollars a year in in uh, transfer payments and and you know welfare programs mm-hmm. in kind and whatnot, or you can be born to a family with twenty thousand dollars in earned income but two parent married parents. You're going to choose. You should choose the two parent household regardless of income. Right. That it's the the greatest privilege today in America is growing up with two married parents who stay together. You know, we always look at the proximate causes to crimes. What drove that? I mean, I mean, marriage rates are, are, are divorce rates and single single childhood rates are, are rising for both for all ethnic groups in, in America. It's obviously much, much higher with blacks, but whites are doing their best to catch up. How much of that was 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 driven by by financial benefits given in the late 60s how much of that was from johnson's great you know great great initiative to to end poverty versus more cultural acceptance of that or are those two things do you think hand in hand yes i have to say i'm a i'm somewhat skeptical of the policy argument that this was all rational calculation looking at the where you have the most money, whether it's being on AFDC, the welfare for single mother program, or having a husband and therefore becoming disqualified from AFDC. I'm just, I'm, you know, there's many people I respect who've made that argument, Thomas Sowell and Charles Murray. uh, But I'm not sure that people, at least in the underclass, are are that rational in their calculations? Well, well, it made it possible, though, didn't it? I mean, you, you know, you know, you don't have to be a, you don't have to be a, a an economist to know that when you have a baby and you start getting a check for X dollars because society doesn't want to see you living in the street with, you know, society is being very nice to you. Um, you don't think that 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 knowing that that you would be able to ha- have financial help coming your way if you decided to have that baby made that more likely? I, I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not an expert in this at all. Yeah, you're probably right. Um, we did try to reform welfare and put some time limits on it and right. a work requirement in 1996 with the federal law in New York City. It didn't have any effect on out of wedlock child rearing, but maybe it was too late at that right. point. And these right. and the the reforms were frankly pretty weak. I mean, they should have just said uh, no additional cash for new children no cash at all for teenagers uh and really they should have said no cash period you know here's here's some food you know we'll give you food we're not going to give you food stamps which you're going to use on soda and potato chips and and absolute crap obesity producing processed foods um so had we been much more courageous in cutting back on the entitlement mentality, maybe it would have had a difference. But mm-hmm. but I do think that uh, the cultural factors are, are important as well, which is mm-hmm. the demonization of males and the hatred of bourgeois propriety, which is uh, two parents and the glorification of promiscuity and, and uh, you know, liberation from, from traditional norms. Is there a better word than bourgeois? That might be the right one. It just sounds so upper class French. I know. Uh, it sounds like I sh- you sh- people are wearing ascots. <laughs> well, the question maybe is, not. maybe the battle has to be fought to reclaim that word rather than getting a new word. Maybe the problem is we do react that way. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and it, but it, you know, it also has Marxist roots, you know, right. the law were, were viewed as the enemy. So that should right. maybe well, sort of erase yeah. it. But I, you know, I use it as a shorthand and I was once asked to define it and was uh, came up short. And since then, I know how to define it, which is that if you find graffiti self-evidently repugnant, self-evidently theft, self-evidently assault, self-evidently right. an attack on that's everything good... that's important to civilization, you are bourgeois. And if instead you find graffiti cool and hip and artistic and, a statement. and self, right. you know, and, and we're going to have a, a, uh, 
exhibit celebrating graffiti at the Museum of Contemporary Art under Jeffrey Deitch in, in Los Angeles or, or in Paris, uh, then you are anti-bourgeois. Heather, I was, in, uh, I was in Athens a couple weeks ago, and it is the cradle of human civilization, right? I mean, they invented the concept of human self-worth. They invented the concept of self-government. It's a shithole. Uh -huh. the every at least 50 percent of the buildings yeah. in, in in there are tagged not by art you know i mean like you could see a couple pictures of 1970 subways and you're like you know what that kid had something going on this is just crap on it and i'm not talking like like in some some areas where where you know they'll they'll tag the uh, the metal grate that comes over i mean the 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 marble buildings that were that were you know that were have been standing some of them for hundreds of years it was like it was like driving around in a trash can, and I just couldn't understand it. I'm sure it's the same thing that people now come and see when they when they see San Francisco. But I thought, you know, you guys can fix this shit in a week, you know, if, if you had to. You know, you could you could do one big cleanup campaign and then grab the kids who you're catching to do it and turn them into your next cleaning rounds. And so it must be an acceptance of that and and a, and a hatred towards the government and a hatred towards establishment that allows that to go. But it was uh, it was it was it was a shock to my senses that I I, I wasn't expecting. Well, I uh, this is going to turn off a lot of your viewers, but I revere Europe in many ways. Uh, I think there's still on on many things they're still holding on to standards in a way we're not. I mean, Macron in in France has said. You know, we're not going to tear down statues here. We're not going to rename cities uh, and streets. We're proud of our civilization. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is the root of so much that I love. But I have to say, Europe on graffiti is way behind the United States. They still have this dopey idea that it's irrelevant or that it's artistic. And it is amazing, even in the Germanic cities, the outskirts in, in Vienna or Munich, uh, there's a much, much higher degree of graffiti. Now, I'm going to disagree with you. It's, it's obviously utterly spirit killing to see it on important monuments, but it is just as spirit killing to see it on subways or on roll down grates. And any graffiti anywhere uh, is a signal that public order and social informal social norms have broken down and uh, it must be eradicated. It must not be allowed to stay yeah, I'm not saying it was good there, but I'm saying it just is it it viscerally hits you more when it's on a a piece of beauty or right. when it's on. I mean, when I you know when I saw saw in in Washington D.C. when the World War II monument was hit by graffiti, I want to get in the car and go go just patrol it and thump heads. Um, it's not you know it's right. just it's it's a next level to that than than, than seeing it. I, and now, I, in fairness, I didn't see it as I, I went through a, a number of countries. Athens was was the worst um, um, by by a good chunk. So there is something culturally that was allowing allowing that to go on. Hey, before I let you go, I, I think that that if if somebody said Heather McDonald will be remembered for this, I think it is. I think it is your Ferguson effect and the way that you've you've gone into that. And, and give me a two minute overview of that. How how you see that affecting uh, affecting the world? What 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 that means? how that turns and, and how we're kind of living through that right now. Well, the Ferguson effect is the combined phenomenon of officers backing off of proactive policing under the phony charge of, of systemic police racism and the resultant emboldening of criminals. Uh, and we saw this after the, the Michael Brown shooting in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014 and the subsequent riots uh, that led cops to again, go fetal as Rahm Emanuel said in 2015 when he was the mayor of Chicago uh, and not get out of their cars to do discretionary stops. You know, there's a whole area of police activity that is discretionary, not mandatory. Mandatory is going to a robbery scene when somebody's made a 911 call and taking a police report. The discretionary stuff is using a, pol a police officer using his powers of observation to see suspicious behavior in suspicious locales and trying to intervene, ask a few questions. And cops stopped doing that because uh, they were being told by the elites that they were racist and they were worried about uh, getting into a confrontation with the suspect who resists arrest and having to maybe escalate their own use of force. So they backed off and in 2015 and 2016, you saw the first iteration of the first Ferguson effect, which was a 
the largest two-year increase in homicide in 50 years. You had uh, the, the massacre of, of police officers in Dallas uh, in 2016 and in Baton Rouge. Uh, and in the end of 2014, the assassination in, in uh, New York City of Ramos and Lou. Uh, and then uh, after George Floyd death, as you say, it's either Ferguson effect 2.0 or the Minneapolis effect with 2020 seeing an astounding, and you, you referred to this earlier, 29% annual increase in homicide nationally, which is the largest in recorded history. Uh, and it's worse in 2021 and things are not really getting better in 2022. And it's the same phenomenon of officers backing off and uh, criminals being given license to absolutely run riot uh, mm -hmm. and terrify people and terrorize people. And we're now living in really a cold rolling riots. You know, it's not, they're not built, burning buildings every day, but there's just a level of theft and shoplifting and looting that is persistent uh, in cities after city that, that is a result of the glorification of racial violence after the George Floyd death. You mean it wasn't COVID and guns? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I've, I've read some, you know, I, I remember reading a Seattle, I guess it was post-intelligence, whichever, and, and, you know, they were speculating on, on the causes of crime and they just never touched it. It was, you know, it was COVID. It was more, you know, people buy more guns. And if you look at this, if you know, because us buying guns to protect ourselves as, as, as if those are what's what's creating crime. Well, we lived through the resurgence before. I remember, uh, you know, it, it felt like it was a dark hole in the in the early 80s. And, you know, I remember California, was it 83? What, what year did, uh, did, did Rose Byrd and a couple and, and two other Supreme Court justices get, get bounced out? You know, they were the chase of Bodines of the day. Um, um, and, and, you know, I, I went through a period of time. I mean, there was a period of time in California where if you commit a first degree murder, you were up for parole in five and a half years. Hmm. And first degree cold blooded murder. And and, you know, the the three strikes, the while we've backed off of some of that, we're still you know, we're still not as crazy as that was. But we got we got to stay away from that. It's like that 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 would be a horrific path to to keep going through. All right. Well, you have to be uh, you have to be tired of of of, of fighting this fight. But uh, I appreciate you <laughs> appreciate you giving me some time today. Great. Thank you so much, Ken. I appreciate it. All right, Heather. Thanks again for your time.